All aboard. We're about to hop on to a long train of abuses and usurpations. Why would I want to hop on that train, Richie? Good question. But it is a train that our founding fathers hopped off of, leading into the American Revolution. This comes from a phrase used by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. So in this segment, we're going to take a look at the reasons that the 13 colonies seceded from the British Empire and declared their independence as the United States of America. This is going to be looking at, for those of you reviewing for the EOC test, at Standard 1.2, which focuses on British traditions of government and tensions between the British Parliament and the colonies. And so the Declaration of Independence was written in 1776, and it was written to explain to the world why the United States are declaring their independence from Great Britain. And they also wanted to let the King of England know why they were so ticked off and let the world know that they're not just throwing a temper tantrum. This has gone on for a very long time. Jefferson writes as he explains what the colonies are doing, the United States rather, keep in mind we're at a transitional point here, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they were accustomed. You take a look today at our approval of the federal government, for example. It's not very high. Congressional approval rating is less than 20%. Well, why aren't we trying to overthrow the government? People may not be happy with the government, but it's not so bad that we can't go about doing our day-to-day -day business. Uh, we have to go to work. We have to go to school. We have other concerns besides overthrowing the government. So Jefferson notes that in most cases, people are going to tend to suffer while the evils are sufferable, that people don't just overthrow the government at the slightest provocation. But, Jefferson writes, when a long train of abuses and usurpations <laughs> evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government. And, then Jefferson goes on to note all of the abuses of King and Parliament over the last 16 some odd years. And so let's go back to where the colonies were 16 years before this during the French and Indian War, um, you know, at a time when the colonies were largely left alone. This is a policy called salutary neglect. Uh, typically, when we think of neglect, we think that's a bad thing, child neglect, animal neglect. But there are certain times where being neglected is a good thing. You might appreciate it if your parents neglect you a little more, uh, those of you who are high school age. Sometimes neglecting can be a sign of respect. Uh, sometimes says, hey, we trust you. We're not going to meddle in your affairs. And so the colonies had seen for a long time a British government that really left them alone let them be. This was all going to change with the French and Indian War, which ended in 1763. This was a war between Great Britain and France uh, to determine who would be supreme in North America as the colonial power. The British won this war, but wars cost money, and this war cost the British a lot of if you look here at the British national debt, you can see that during the French and Indian War, it skyrocketed almost 140 million pounds, quite a bit by British standards at that time. The British decided that they would like to maintain an army in the colonies. Now, why? I'm not sure. The French have been defeated. Why do the British need troops there? Well, because the British in Britain didn't want troops in their country. They didn't like the idea of peacetime standing armies. And so the British government decided they were going to headquarter troops in the colonies. And they wanted the colonists to pay the cost of quartering, of housing these troops in the colonies. Now, did the colonists ask for these troops? 
No, of course not. They don't want these troops either. So the colonies are going to have to pay to support something that they don't want, something that they didn't ask for. And this policy of salutary neglect after the French and Indian War is over. And the colonists are going to have to deal with, for the first time, the British government telling them how to live their lives, intervening in their lives, their liberties, their respective pursuits of happiness. The first car on this long train of abuses is the Proclamation of 1763. The British got a whole lot of land out of the French and Indian War, and the colonists were really excited. But then the British government says, look, we're going to draw a line right here at the Appalachian Mountains. You can't go past this line. The land west of this line is reserved for the Indians. The colonists were outraged. We won this war. You're not going to let us go west? And keep in mind, this is going to be a recurring theme of U.S. history, that these American colonists, uh, later these uh, American citizens, are going to want to move west, and they are going to want to push the Indians out of the way, just as the British had been doing since they first started their colonies. And so after the proclamation of 1763, keep in mind, no need to secede from the British Empire just yet. But something to remember. And then Parliament levies three taxes on the colonists in rapid succession. First of all, the Sugar Act. Second, the Stamp Act. And the third, the Townsend Acts. These are all in the 1760s. So keep in mind that the 1760s, this is a period of time uh, where Parliament is taxing. No shots are being fired or anything like that. The conflict is over taxation. Now, smuggling was a serious problem. You remember talking about mercantilism in your studies of colonial America. Um, the British wanted British colonial ships to trade only with British ports. Uh, the whole point of mercantilism is to try to limit your imports. So when a shipper like John Hancock or somebody goes to a French port or a Dutch port and gets sugar and brings it to colonial Massachusetts, that, by British standards, did not make the British government any money. It did not contribute to the self-sufficiency of the empire. And so smuggling is becoming a problem. Now, the British had the Navigation Acts on the books, which said that you have to trade with British ports. But due to the policy of salutary neglect, this was largely ignored. And so the Sugar Act is the first of these taxes levied on the colonies, and this is an import tax on foreign sugar. Now, keep in mind, what this is is actually a tax cut. The British government lowers the tax because they hadn't been collecting it. So they lower it in hopes that people will actually pay it. But in all practicality, this is a tax increase because you cut the tax in half, but you actually collect it. If the tax was $10, you didn't collect it. Now it's $5, you do collect it. I'm still $5 short. So shippers were outraged at this. And on top of having a practical tax increase, when smugglers were caught, they were brought before admiralty courts instead of before juries of their peers, violating a British right to jury trials that ex existed ever since the Magna Carta. The Stamp Act. Now here's the big one, because the Stamp Act was an internal tax, okay? The Sugar Act had been an import tax. Nobody disputes Parliament's authority to tax imports. They may be upset about it, but they don't dispute that Parliament has the authority. But the Stamp Act was an internal tax on all legal documents. Everything from a deed to a piece of property to a college degree um, to any kind of contract had to be printed on paper with this special stamp on it. Now, this outraged colonist um, who engaged in massive resistance. Uh, here is a cartoon from a newspaper that portrays the stamp as a skull and crossbones. Uh, two things the colonists did uh, to oppose the Stamp Act were, first of all, boycotts. They quit buying British goods. And second of all, they engaged in mob violence, uh, protests in the streets, and acts of intimidation. And the rallying cry 
against the Stamp Act was the cry of no taxation without representation. Um, that the British believed in the principle of taxation by consent that had also been established in the Magna Carta as well as in the English Bill of Rights. And so the taxing authority, as the colonists saw it, was not in Parliament where they had no authority to uh, vote for the members of Parliament where they weren't represented, but it was in the colonies uh, where they were going to be taxed because these were people that they voted for. They believed that any internal tax had to be approved by their colonial legislatures. Nobody disputed Parliament's authority to tax imports, but they did dispute Parliament's authority to tax them directly without the consent of their representatives. And there were a few groups involved in these resistance movements. Uh, if you were a guy, you could join the Sons of Liberty, uh, which uh, engaged in acts of intimidation, uh, engaged in mass protests, uh, and uh, all kinds of other fun. Here you see a British cartoon of some Sons of Liberty at a Liberty Tree, uh, which is where they would gather at a Liberty Tree or a Liberty Pole. And as you can see here, this Liberty Tree has a noose hanging around it. And the Sons of Liberty are tarring and feathering a tax collector. Now, tarring and feathering uh, looks like fun, but keep in mind the tar has to be in liquid form, which means it has to be very hot. It smells bad, sticks to your skin. Uh, they're pouring boiling tar on you and then putting feathers on there and then would parade you around an act of humiliation. Uh, this was not something you'd want to be involved in, at least being on the receiving end. Uh, very, very painful. Uh, but you can see here how the British are objecting to what they see as lawless behavior on the part of the colonists. The Daughters of Liberty they would uh, produce homespun fabric. Now, the point of colonies was for the colonies to produce raw materials and trade with the mother country who would produce finished goods. And so in most of the colonial period, if you had money, you like to show off your fancy British suit. Well, now it's cool not to buy British goods, almost like college students who like to go to the thrift store, even if they can afford uh, higher priced clothing, they want to go to the thrift store because that's what's in. Well, uh, they would have loved to live at this time because it was in, no matter how much money you have, to wear a suit of homespun cloth. Don't let somebody catch you walking around in some fancy British suit. And so the whole point of what the Daughters of Liberty were doing was reducing dependence on the British textile industry. And as you can see, uh, they were pretty effective. Um, here you can see that the Sons of Liberty are saying that they are going to meet at the Liberty Tree to accept the resignation of a tax collector who had no doubt been intimidated. Um, so we see that the resistance to the Stamp Act was successful. And uh, the following year, the Stamp Act was repealed. But Parliament's not done. Okay, they repeal the Stamp Act because British merchants uh, were leaning on them to do so, but they are not finished taxing. This fight is not over. Parliament is going to tax five different products in the form of the Townsend Acts, named after the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, basically the Secretary of the Treasury. The Townsend Acts, once again, we're going back to import taxes. This isn't direct. All right, uh, but paper, paint, lead, glass, tea. All right, again, paper, paint, lead, glass, and tea. Five products whose importation is going to be taxed by Parliament. Now these guys show up again, okay? So Parliament's gotten the ball rolling, and the Sons of Liberty are back to their old tricks, um, trying to fight the tax. And because of that, you have more of these guys. And that is going to cause a problem uh, in the colonies uh, because you have these rowdy people here and then you have these people here whose job it is to keep order. And so what we see here as a result is the Boston Massacre, which is a confrontation between British troops and what is essentially a rowdy mob. 
Of course, Paul Revere likes to portray the Boston Massacre as something that, uh, you know, was, well, essentially a massacre. Um, if you look at this cartoon here, you see women, you see children, uh, you see a dog just kind of wondering what's going on, what's up with all these dead people. Uh, you see the British soldiers neatly lined up in a row, um, shooting as if they just marched up there and thought, hey, let's go shoot some colonists. That would be a lot of fun. And their commanding officer has his sword held up, um, giving the order to fire. Now, this was uh, created by Paul Revere, a silversmith, uh, who was using this as an instrument of propaganda. As you can see behind the British soldiers, uh, it says Butcher's Hall. Okay, everything here is very carefully orchestrated. Now, you might say, hey, y'all are making this look like it's in broad daylight. Paul Revere says, uh-uh. Look at that moon. Okay, very obvious here this is going on at night. Now, this is an exercise in deception. What really happened was a few British soldiers were on duty at night in the dead of winter, and some laborers, dock workers, uh, people who wanted to start some trouble were probably drunk. They came up to them and, hey, Mr. Lobster Back, that's what they called them, uh, all kinds of bad names, like, hey, why don't you fire? And then, uh, you know, would throw snowballs, would throw ice, would throw rocks and sticks. And uh, while snowballs can be fun, you pack that thing together enough and that thing can hurt. Um, and so these British soldiers are being harassed and they call for help. More British soldiers arrive. As more British soldiers arrive, more colonists arrive. And this angry mob is shouting, this is chaos. Um, keep in mind, these British soldiers have muskets, but once you fire that one time, that's, that's it for you if you've got a crowd right on you. These guys feel threatened. Now, you think about the guy in the rank and file. As these colonists are all yelling, why don't you fire? Now, eventually, somebody is going to, uh, is going to panic, okay? Somebody, when they hear the word fire, they're going to shoot, and finally somebody does. And uh, then you have six colonists lying dead on the ground uh, in the midst of all of the chaos. But keep in mind that uh, Paul Revere's propaganda was instrumental in influencing public opinion and causing people to think that this was indeed a massacre. All of these guys were let off. Uh, John Adams defended them at their trial. Uh, they were found not guilty by a local Massachusetts jury. But, as a result of this, the Townsend Acts were repealed, with one exception, the tax on tea remains. And so Parliament wants to show that, look, we are going to get rid of a lot of these taxes, but we want you to know that we can tax, okay? So don't think that we can't as proof we've got this tax on tea. Now, it looks like at this point the coast is clear. Keep in mind that the American Revolution is not inevitable. It really could have stopped here. You've got just a tax on tea. Parliament has asserted itself, uh, but they're kind of backing off. But then we have about three years of quiet. And then we will get to the point where the long train of abuses is just uh, going with too much speed to stop. And the colonists are going to have to jump off.